Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Wallace. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. I don't know if you can see me. It's pretty dark. It's fine. Uh, there he is. Okay. Okay, so we're really excited to have you online today with us. Um, um, I, I can hear you. You're a little bit muffled, but uh, so do you want me to go first with an introduction and then you guys will introduce yourselves? All right. Well, uh, you know my name, Guy Wallace. I've been in the instructional design business since 1979, and if you made it to the very last page of the handout I sent, you can read all about that stuff. Um, I've been very lucky in my career. I have a radio TV film degree. And I was working uh, during college for a lumber company, uh, Wix Lumber. It's kind of like Home Depot or Lowe's. And I worked with for them as an inside salesperson for two and a half years. And when I got when I got ready to graduate, my managers, three of them that I had worked for, all told the people at headquarters in Saginaw, Michigan, that they needed to hire me because they were installing video capabilities for their training organization. And so they were gonna be you know, introducing that technology and I have that degree in radio, TV, film. And so I ended up going to work uh, in Saginaw, Michigan and I got introduced because of the people that I went to work with, um, they were very much into NSPI, the National Society for Performance and Improvement, which is now ISPI, the International Society. And I got introduced to uh, people like Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert and Joe Harless and Bob Mager and lots of other people, but those are probably the four biggest gurus back in 1979 and in the early 80s. Um, and I got introduced to the to ISPI, the group that's now ISPI. Um, and I became a consultant. I went so I worked at Wix for 18 months, and then I moved to Illinois and I joined Motorola. And where I got a chance to work on projects with Gary Rumler. And I got a chance to meet a guy named Neil Rackham, who's famous for spin selling. These were consultants that were brought into my organization. And another consultant was Ray Svensson. And after 18 months at Motorola, I joined Ray Svensson's small consulting company. It was Ray and a, an administrative person, a secretary, as we called them back in the day and another consultant and i joined at the same time they brought on another admin person so there was five of us to start and i helped them grow that business and got introduced to consulting that way i had some experience at two firms all of you are in this class to learn about consulting so i figured that this might be somewhat interesting but my point is going to be that i learned a lot because i was lucky and got exposed to the right kind of people that have performance orientation to instruction. Um, and then I went to work at Motorola where that's what they were all about. In fact, I got hired at Motorola because on the bottom of the first page of my 16 page resume in booklet form was the name where it said, I was a practitioner of the methods of Gary Rumler. And the person answering the mail said, our new director had mentioned this guy named Gary Rumler, I better set this resume aside. And so I got hired because I simply put the right name on my resume because I knew, I knew his methodologies. So I was very lucky again. And I would meet with Ray Spencer allowed me to leave Motorola and join the small consulting firm. And so I've been doing consulting 
with basically Fortune 500 companies since 1982. That's enough about me for now, so it's your turn. You're very muffled, so I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing you, but I just heard that you were uh, familiar with HBT and ISPI. Project to the back row. Okay. So do you all have, is that it? Yeah, that's it. That's all. all right. So do you all have this uh, document in front of you? Yeah. All right. So uh, if, if, because it's difficult for me to hear you clearly, it's, it was very muffled, but I think I got the gist of it. And so thank you for inviting me to your, to your class. Again, you're all interested in consulting. Um, and your first question was, how do you define performance consulting? And that... Uh, prompted me to put together this graphic on the front of the page, uh, the front page. And in the center there in green, this performance competence is my definition. Now, I'm, I'm in the training business, and I, probably 90% of my consulting engagements involve training. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit more of that later, but but so my focus has always been improving the performance of the individuals or teams or departments or functions, uh, depending on what my uh, uh, consulting engagement was. But so I needed a definition for this. What is this performance thing all about? And I, and, and I do not like the, the phrase or the terminology or the definition of competencies. Uh, competencies are very general, usually. You have to have a competency in communications, yeah, verbal communications or written communications, but until that's applied someplace specifically, it's very nebulous. So it's, you know, you can't develop good training on verbal communications if you don't know what the context is 
because it could be a very easy conversation we're expecting people to have, or it could be a very difficult conversation that people need to have. And training needs to be authentic. Uh, the explanations of uh, the training, the demonstrations, the exercises you people put you put people through needs to be authentic to what their job is. And so, this performance competency competence is the ability to perform tasks, produce outputs to the stakeholder requirements. And the tasks and the outputs is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And I think what most people struggle with and what most people do not do well is understand who are the stakeholders and what do they want? And so I put together a model and published an article back in 93 in one of the quality journals that said, here's an example. Now, this is what one of three examples that I typically use, but every situation is different. But we could say that, you know, the customer is king. And I got into an argument with a client a long time ago that the customer is not a king because you work in the defense industry and the government has regulations that you can't violate. <laughs> the customer wants you to dump toxic waste out the back door to reduce their costs. They don't get to be king. Government has regulations against that and they'll put people in jail and fine you and so they win. So the government is the king. Well, I'm a child of the 60s, so I don't like the idea of the government being king. But they do set the regulations and the laws and the codes and all of that that everybody needs to comply with. But the governments work for society, and so society has, I uh, put them at the top, there's this concept of social responsibility in the learning business and in the performance improvement business where we should, all the companies should be working for a better society, and I, I like that. It's not always true, it's idealistic, but that's what I would strive for. So that's why they're at the top of this hierarchy. But, so if push comes to shove and two stakeholders disagree, who wins? The customers want you to uh, dump toxic waste and the government says no. Well, there's a hierarchy to these stakeholders. When people have to make decisions in business, they have to decide it's important. So they get to decide what are the appropriate measures of an output. You could be building toys and manufacturing a place and the government has safety standards for those toys. But there's also other government agencies that have standards and measures for the process. So it's both the process and the output and there's measures for both. And customers have expectations for outputs, but the government also has expectations for outputs. And employees, they want a safe working process. So there's a lots of different stakeholders, and that's the intent of this, is that if you're going to be a performance consultant or even a training consultant or learning and development, whatever your favorite language is, um, you are helping people to learn how to perform how to produce outputs by performing tasks, and there's a whole bunch of outsiders that are invisible for the most part, and they get to decide what the measures and standards of that performance is. So that's, that's the top part of the diagram. And at the bottom of the diagram, I wasn't sure I see that you're in educational technology, but this whole performance improvement movement it's been going on for decades and back into the 60s. Um, there's more to performance or process performance than knowledge and skills, which is what training addresses or learning and development addresses. And so it's one spot in this fishbowl diagram at the bottom there, the awareness, knowledge, and skills. That's what training can work on. But there's all these other variables. So one of the things that I've learned to do as a performance consultant was to look beyond knowledge and skill requirements. And if people are struggling in their jobs and the client wants to train them to get to make that go away, that, I had to have a, uh, an approach that helped you look at all the other variables because I could help them spend lots of money on training and it wouldn't do a darn thing. And then my reputation 
goes down the tubes. And that's no good. That's no good for anybody. So one of the things in my approach to all of this is to look beyond just the knowledge and skills of individuals or teams or the entire department and look at what are the other variables that might have gaps. Because my client only doesn't want just training, they want improved performance. And they often see training as a means to that end, but sometimes got very little to do with that end. Anyway, so page off of that to the first question. How do I define performance consulting? Well, I'll try to define for you what performance is. The ability to perform tasks, to produce outputs, to stakeholder requirements. Um, many times in this field that I've been in for four decades almost, performance consulting and performance improvement is sometimes looked at as simply performance-based training. In, in, a, in an enterprise context versus education con in, in your educational class, nobody knows exactly what job you're, you're being educated to go do. That's, that's a, we know, need to know something about consulting, we're guessing here, but we don't know exactly what that looks like. What are your outputs and tasks gonna be? What are, what are you gonna be required to do as a consultant? Well, we can kind of guess some of those things and get close, but we don't know specifically. But if you joined a consulting firm, they would know exactly what they want you to do. Well, but that's an unknown here. So we can only approximate in the education world. In an enterprise training context, usually that's more easy to define. And so consulting is the ability to offer advice to help make improvements, to understand what's the current state and what's the future state that's really potential, not blue sky, some maybe you could get there, but no, you need to be somewhat feasible future state. And so there's a gap between the current state and the future state, and you have to figure out how to get from that current state to the future state. What knowledge and skills required, but maybe you'll need more machinery, more software, more desks and, and chairs, and who knows what else. But that's, that's part of the plan. So if you're gonna be into performance consulting, it's more than just training or learning or job aids, which is how they is called performance support. It's understanding more holistically, taking a systems view of all of that. Now that's a long answer, but and is, is my audio coming across okay? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. All right. So, one of the things there is I put down there in the third paragraph in my long answer here is that it's more than just knowledge and skills. So and you, if you're going to be in a consulting business, you have to be acutely aware of what people are saying and what the heck they mean by what they say. So I have learned that when I hear people say performance consulting, I'm wary. You know, I, I, my antenna go up and I have to try to figure out the heck do they mean by that phrase? I mean, I know what I mean, but I don't know what they mean. And so there's different things you need to use to, to determine that. But I find a lot of people in the training business, in the educational realm, talk about performance consulting, but what they really mean is performance-based education or performance-based training. They don't think about or consider, them, consider all the other variables that are required for performance. Any follow-up questions on that? No. There are no questions so far. All right. Um, this, the second question is, what are the steps to grow to be a successful performance consultant? And so I've got an A and a B answer here, and one of them is learn everything about what you're gonna be focused on as a performance consultant. If it's sales, you need to be uh, totally aware and understanding of all aspects of sales. What's the sales process? What's the, all the other variables? What are the knowledge and skills? Who are the clients? What's the marketplace? What's the products? To be a consultant, you have to really get to a full understanding of that entire system. And that's very difficult to do. 
Uh, worse is when you're resp- you work in a company and you're an internal consultant and you have to support HR and you have to support sales and manufacturing and distribution and service organizations and the finance organization and everybody. So that's becomes very difficult for an individual like myself to go in there and learn everything in order to do a good job. So I cheat. I I assemble a team of people from that world, sales or HR, finance or wherever. Or maybe it's a process and there's finance people on there and a project manager on there and engineers on there, you know, so it depends on what the focus of an engagement is. So answer B is I learned how to facilitate a group of people who actually know all of that stuff and I can be the dummy and ask the dumb questions. They'll give me the smart answers. And then we'll all sit around and go, aha, there it is. There's the process. There's what's where the gaps are. Here's where the problems are. We can talk about the fixes to make problems go away and figure out how to get from the current state at future state. So one of the things that I, I really dislike, consultants who have to become the experts themselves, because I don't think that there's really any feasible way for somebody to go in and study an organization, spend a week, a month, a year, and understand what 20-year veterans know. There's just no way to do that. You can't observe people, see what's going on inside their head. You can see what their uh, behaviors are, but you can't see their cognitive processes. You don't understand why did they do that. And maybe you didn't even know that there was a why, that they could have done this or they could have done that, and you wouldn't know. They, you just watch what they do. You can read documents. You can interview people. Um, but that's problematic. So I think one of the steps to becoming a successful performance consultant is to figure out your own methodology or approach for analyzing performance, understanding what the gaps are, and then figuring out the future state and a plan to get there. And so I use a facilitated group process to do that. Again, in my third paragraph there, I've got don't, don't play performance improvement with performance-based training. Too many people do that. And But if you're going to be in the training field, that's fine. It's a great field. I, I love it. But I just have to be aware that training is not always the solution, even though the clients may think that's true. They may think that they can train their problems away, and they most likely cannot. Um, so one of the things that, that become a successful consultant is there's a lot to be learned from the uh, PQM, Total Quality Management Movement. Um, that's where you could learn about processes and how processes are diagnosed. And it, there's a lot of quality engineers in the world that do very similar things to what performance improvement specialists or performance consultants do. Again, it's beyond training, although training and knowledge and skills may be part of what needed in the new future state, but it's certainly not. Um, so you're, if you if you have questions, somebody raise their hand and I'll shut up. Uh, yes. So for, for the group that you put together of experts, um, for, for the group of experts that you put together in the domain that you'll be consulting on, is that just people from your own personal network or, or sorry, personal and professional network or employer, employees of the client that you're looking yeah, for? They're employees of the client. Um, uh, famous uh, gurus in this business call them exemplars. And I had my own clients at Motorola went, ah, exemplars, use language that we understand, guy. And so I said, master performers. <laughs> so when they call them, and, it's, and I differentiate master performers from subject matter experts, SMEs, subject matter experts. They know a lot about a subject, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they can do the job to a level of mastery. So when I talk about I want master performers from sales, if I'm studying sales, I want your best salespeople. I don't want your average salespeople or your poor salespeople. I want the best. I want to understand what the best do in order to become known as the best salespeople. 
or manufacturing engineers or whatever the target is. So those people that I would assemble into teams are, are master performers and other subject matter experts as required from the client organization. Um, they are the ones who are gonna know how things really work, what really is broken or silly or stupid, and your goal is to remove those kinds of barriers. Experts, master performers, uh, they figured out how to work the current system that they live in and become successful despite all the barriers, all the silly and stupid stuff that you find in a major corporation. It's just, it's in, it's there. You know, silly and stupid stuff is all over the place in most corporations. So you never yes. need to, you never need to, um, um, involve uh, a subject matter expert there. well you do sometimes so if i'm working on a a new product development team and there's a new there's product managers and you may need experts from finance and from other disciplines involved to look at that because it's more than just product managers doing their product management thing there's you know, the financial aspects of how much are you going to spend to bring the, the product to market, et cetera. So you have to look at the performance in a holistic way to decide who are all the players. And if you're going to study that, you need people from all the organizations that typically perform in that um, domain, that process or that function. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so on Monday, we were discussing the issue with Starbucks in class. And I yes. wanted to get your feedback on their decision to have the one-day training. Also, what would be your approach to that um, situation? And who would be your exemplars? Well, all right. So number one, <laughs> Starbucks is not going to solve much um, with a one-day training session or a one-week training session or a one-year training session. Um, people already... so. So my, the gurus, the mentors that I had would have said, it's the consequence system. So I owned two consulting firms. I was partnering two consulting firms where I had a staff of 15 to 20 people. And when, when we used to hire people, I had my office manager hire the office staff and I or one of my partners hired the consultants. And in their interview, I would have them come into my office and I would tell them, if you do, if you, um, are sexually abusive to anybody, I'm firing you immediately. If my office manager isn't here, I'll go get the damn checkbook and I'll write your check and you're out the door. Do you understand? And of course they go, uh, yeah. I go, okay, and so if you do anything that's, I have uh, zero tolerance for uh, racist behavior. If anybody does that, damn it, you're fired immediately. I'll go find that checkbook and write you a check and you'll be out of here. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. And there was a third one, I can't think of it right now, but so it's really about consequences. So if everybody understood what's acceptable behavior, what's unacceptable behavior, and what happens for damn sure if you violate the expectations, then that's all the training you need. So, you know, so I think if training is not the right spot, now what they're doing with the training is they're making everybody acutely aware that this is a problem and we don't like it. And by God, we're going to bring everybody into a one day training session and shut down the business and do all that. So it's a big deal. They've made a big deal out of it, which is maybe important to get everybody's attention. But then the training sh session should have been, if you do this, we fire you. No kidding, for sure. Bet on it. And if you do this other thing, we fire you for sure, bet on it, that's it. Understand the consequences. Now, if you behave appropriately, these are the rewards. So everything can't be about negative consequences. There's positive consequences as well. But in a situation like in Starbucks, uh, I've participated in discussions on social media about this. And most of the people that I respect in the training business know that training is not going to solve that. Unless that training said, here's the line, cross it, you're out of here, you're fired, that's it. And you, so the, the consequences have to be immediate, for sure, no people squeezing by and getting by without that. So 
you, that's what that's what it takes. It's not a train. It's not a knowledge and, and skills issues. People know better. They just behave inappropriately for whatever reason, and you just can't tolerate it. So, sorry, that's a long answer. <laughs> Can I ask a little follow-up to that? Certainly. Oh, so that employee was probably following the rules that are written down in the training handbook. When they start the job, they have, you know, they have to go by these rules that say if someone sits down and doesn't order anything, you're authorized to ask them to leave. So, do you think Starbucks has a lawsuit on its hands right now? No, I don't know that. I don't know that that's that would be in their handbook because I think that they have a policy. It's perhaps unwritten, and that's part of the problem. It's informal, so I need it's up to interpretation. But a lot of times they let a lot of people, white people especially, come in, sit down, talk with their neighbors for hours and hours and hours, don't buy a damn thing, and then leave, and nobody gets upset about that. So um, they just need to have a more uh, uniform. Uh, approach to this thing here. But if it was in their handbook, then it needs to be equally applied. So I've been in Starbucks where I brought in my own coffee and <laughs> no one caught me doing that, but and I was talking with people who did buy something, so maybe they let, they cut me some slack. But um, yeah, I just, I think that, so that's one of the things when you're a performance consultant, you have to look and say, well, you know, so there's a famous guy in the training business, Bob Mager. Robert F. Mager wrote a lot of good books about this stuff, but he has this saying, which is um, something you can't say nowadays, but he said, if you put a gun to their head, could they do it? Well, if they could, that means you didn't have a knowledge and skill issue, you had a motivation issue. And so uh, do people really know what's appropriate and not? And I think most cases they do but they behave inappropriately anyway. Um, and it's really because of the consequences, because people think, well, I can say this, other people say it, no one gets in trouble around here. You know, maybe once in a while somebody gets in trouble, but, you know, so it's a it's a risk factor. So, if, but if you know, that's why I made a big deal about telling my employees, you do this, you do this, you do this, you're out of here, that's it. I don't care if the office manager isn't here to write you a check, I'll write the damn check, you know, and you'll be out of here. And I was very dramatic on purpose, by design, because I wanted them to know that I was not going to tolerate this and I didn't want anybody to say later, well, we didn't really understand. I, you know, I don't have any tolerance for that kind of stuff. That's, But that was me. And I owned the firm so I could do those kinds of things. And, and my other partners, when I had other partners, they, they were with me. But I've been places where I saw that kind of garbage go on and I, you know, hated it. And once you get to the point to where you you own a company or you're in control, you can affect those kinds of things. Um, but it's really the consequence system was not correct at Starbucks. And it's hard when you have uh, distributed branches and, and shops like that all over the place. It's hard for the district manager or whoever to come visit each one of those and see if everything is going okay. Because every, I was in the Navy and when we had people come in to inspect my ship, well, we made, you know, one room in the ship very pretty. It was perfect. They came in, saw that, got one left, and the rest of the ship looked like garbage, you know, crap. Um, but so I, there's games that get to play with those kinds of things, and, you know, I just don't like that personally. But anyway, shall I go on to the third question? Yes, thank you. So what competencies, so, uh, and what's the best way to develop them? I think... Uh, educating yourself through formal training, reading books, learning from others, joining the local chapter of ATD and ISPI. You have an ISPI chapter and then in Montreal, you should check it out. Um, but you need to master certain things. You need to learn to present and uh, uh, create a presentation even though you may not be delivering it. Or sometimes somebody else creates it and you'd have to deliver it. Or you get to create it and deliver your own stuff. That's how it works sometimes. But, you know, how to interview clients, how to interview master performers and subject matter experts. So there are basic skills here in my list here that you can learn. So you need to, um, you know, there's a lot of things here. If you're going to be a consultant, that's very different than being an individual contributor in some training organization for a big company. When you're a consultant, you're supposed to kind of be able to almost walk on water. 
And so you need to be well-versed and well-skilled and well-rounded. And even if you just specialize in sales and sales stuff only, there's still a lot to, to master here in terms of your interpersonal skills, your uh, planning and time management skills. I mean, there's a lot to it, so it's not simple. Um, if you're conscientious as a person, you'll tend to be more successful. Um, but so there's a lot of things that, uh, that you would learn from in the instructional design business and in the performance improvement business and in the total quality management movement. There's a lot of things here that you, you would need to learn and master. And that takes some time unless you were lucky like me and I got exposed to the right people and I got a chance to work with the right people and learn from them. And that was my apprenticeship. Um, so. I, but I fully appreciate that not everybody has that opportunity. Uh, I was just very, very, very lucky. And but I've hired consultants onto my into my staff. And uh, one, you had to you know present yourself well because my clients were going to pay big bucks for you to show up and do work in their organization. So you can't look like a slob, you know. So there's a you know and the, nowadays it's very different. I'm talking you know in the 80s and 90s, but now. It's, you know, I, I always had to keep my hair shorter than I wanted it because of who I work for, Fortune 500, you know, the men in black suits. Um, and uh, there were fewer women back then than there are nowadays. But so um, I had to, you know, I couldn't turn them off at all. Well, today I think things are a lot different here. And if somebody has an earring, a man, that, that's much more acceptable. Back at those days here, I remember I had to tell a w young woman that worked for me not to wear open-toed shoes. And she was there about a year and a half. She started wearing them anyway because she said, the hell with you. I'm good. I'm, I'm good at what I do and no one's going to complain. And so I had to let it go. But, you know, because I was kind of old school because I worked in those kinds of big corporate environments where things were more staid. Um, so the fourth question here is, how can a new consultant with almost no experience in the field other than schoolwork find clients and secure consulting contracts? One, I wouldn't recommend it. I would never, I would, I couldn't, I could hire somebody, some consultants I hired were kindergarten teachers before they came to work for me. They were smart, sharp people. I could tell they presented themselves well. I thought if I could teach them my methodologies, they'll be successful. And so I was willing to bring those people in here, um, but they had demonstrated their ability to learn by getting a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. But so I was used to taking people outside of the, you know, back in my early days, there was no instructional design degrees from universities. That was not a thing. And that didn't start really and prevalently until the late 80s, early 90s when it became more prevalent. Um, but so I, so I, one, I think that you shouldn't, as a new person, go out there and try to do that. You could be a freelancer. If you're a very good writer, you could be a freelance writer, but you shouldn't call yourself a consultant. So back in 1986, I wrote an article for my local chapter of NSPI. Now it's ISPI. But in 1986, I talked about the difference between consultants, subcontractors, and freelancers. Because I was almost offended by people who were claiming to be consultants when they, they may have been a good writer, they may have been a good at uh, creating uh, presentations as part of an instructional design program, but they didn't know how to calculate return on investment. They didn't know that, that uh, Return ROE is not return on expectations unless your expectations are return on equity. And so there's a lot of silliness in this profession where people make up terms and make up phrases and all this other stuff. And, and you know, it'd be one thing if you were a consultant and got to meet the big executives, the chief financial officer, and you started talking about return on expectations, ROE, and they would say, I'm sorry, since 1920, ROE has been return on equity. It's a financial calculation that everybody that goes through finance school learns about. And so what's this nonsense about ROE that you're spouting? So 
in order not to, to make a faux pas, you need to have some basic knowledge and skills and capabilities, and you'll develop them over time. So my recommendation would be find an organization to go work for and learn from them, learn from others until you feel you're ready to go out and do this. But, you know, you have to learn how to plan a project. And, you know, if you just fell off the old uh, turnip wagon, you know, you won't know how to plan a project and price it and price it so that you don't go bankrupt because it costs you $20,000 to do a $10,000 project and you're $10,000 in the hole at the end of it. You know, and so there's a lot of moving pieces and parts to being a consultant, you know, uh, making proposals, pricing proposals, presenting proposals, and then executing to that proposal's plan. The, you know, you have to know what you're doing and that just takes some time. Again, if you got lucky like I did, you would have learned from people because that's how they did it. You learn how they did it, and you could then do it and improve on it yourself and and uh, create a career doing that. But I don't think that it's appropriate uh, for brand new people to, to claim that they're a consultant. Now, to be a freelance writer or a freelance uh, art director or do freelance marketing aspects of that, you know, I hired a young woman to join my consulting firm to do the marketing for my firm. Um, but, and she had very little real practical experience, but she was sharp and I thought she could learn and she could learn what our business was, what our language was, our, our industry jargon, and she could master that and help me create marketing pieces. Um, but so I think you got, you got to be careful about that kind of thing. Any questions? I'm on a roll, as you can tell. <laughs> um, uh, what are your what? So, question number five: What are your strategies to build client partnerships? Oh, this is critical, actually. So, um, my preferred approach for all my projects is to convince my client who called me in because they've somehow found me. I don't do cold calling. I don't do things like that. Clients find me because I presented at a conference or wrote an article. They go, hey, I need some of that. And they call me in and I would can try to convince them to not be a client of one, but to assemble a project steering team of other stakeholders. So my client has clients. Those are likely to be some of the group of stakeholders. Um, if we're going to spend a lot of money on this project, maybe we need to invite somebody from finance in so they can make sure that we're not full of BS when we talk about what it's going to cost to put this in place. So, so my clients would sometimes ask, well, how, how could I tell who I should invite in the stakeholders to my project steering team? And I would tell them, Whoever's likely to come out of the work, woodwork any time throughout the whole project and take exception to what we're doing. What are we doing? Why are we doing it this way? If, that, if you know who those people are, get them on the project steering team on day one. Because they can stop you from doing silly and stupid things. We, you know, some consultants can't help themselves. We'll do silly and stupid things too. When, when they may already know the answer and they know what the issues are and they're closest to it. So you want middle or high level managers involved on your project steering team. Maybe there's a subject matter expert in some esoteric thing that's really part of the project and they may not be a manager, but you need them on the steering team anyway to help guide the project, to approve it at various stages. So are you all familiar with the ADDI model? Yeah. Yes. All right. So, so I use a uh, uh, my models are similar to Addy, but it's not quite Addy. But after the analysis phase, before I do design, I want to check in with the project steering team and show them the analysis data. This is the ideal state, or this is the current state, and this is what the problems are. Here's the ideal state. Do you agree? Before we start investing time and energy on a design, so I want to, with the, uh, what some organizations call a gate review meeting. And the gate review meeting means the project steering team gets to raise the gate and let you go through into the next phase, or they shut the gate down and tell you to stop, and they tell you to redo your work or kill the project because what used to make sense no longer does. And I would tell my clients on the project steering team, that's your job in this meeting. We're going to present to you what we did in this last phase, 
and you have four choices, kill the project because it doesn't make any sense anymore. And my clients would always go, whoa, don't tell them that first thing. No, I want them to kill the project if it doesn't make any sense. I'm not here to waste your money. Kill it if it doesn't make any sense. And a lot of the people in the room would go, no, we need this. Okay, good. I'm manipulating you guys to say, yeah, we need this. So they can either amend the data because they know something that's wrong in the data that we've collected or the design, whatever stage we're in. They could make changes to it, get their thumbprints all over it so that they would own it because I need my project steering team to own the analysis data. I need them to own the design. When we develop the stuff, they need to own it. It's theirs. We're working for them. You know, we're working for them. And so getting them, giving them that ownership uh, creates that partnership with them. Then when I tell them I need an analysis team of master performers, don't send in a Guy Wallace type because he doesn't know what the heck he's doing. He's one of what I call a friend of training. He's always available to help the training people out. And he's the kiss of death. He put Guy Wallace's name on the report and everybody goes, this is garbage. So I need them to give me the top master performers, no kidding, and help me and any other subject matter experts that they feel. I tell the, the, the project steering team and you can send in management spies, people that you trust to come back and tell you whether we were doing goofy, stupid things or whether this is good stuff. I just want to know who the management spy is and they're welcome to come in and participate. But I don't want to believe them because they're not a master performer. So if you're not a master performer, I'm less likely to believe you. You're just a management spy. But so that builds trust. That I've invited them to spy on what we do have somebody go back and tell them all that good stuff. And that also facilitates building a client partnership. But now I've got partners. I've got people up at the top, the executives or top managers. I've got an analysis team of master performers. I put them through my facilitating process. They produce good analysis data, good design. They become a design team. Then they'll help with the development. And so I've got, I've trapped them into working on this kind of a project um, because I've got a collaborative process and I collaborate with the right people because I don't, I'm not an expert in what I'm going to produce training on or the performance that I'm going to improve. But if I bring in their experts and they get to battle it out and talk about it and argue it out and come to some consensus, then I have greater assurances that what we're doing is on track. But I would joke with them at the beginning of my meetings with them. And I'd say, you know, if you guys got together at breakfast and decided you were going to pull a fast one on me and just lie and make stuff up, hell, I wouldn't know. So just you know, her names are going to go on the report along with mine. And so if this is all garbage that we produce, everybody's going to know it's your fault, not mine. I'm just the facilitator. And I would tell my clients that I own the process. It's my process. I know what we're going to do first, second, third, fourth, fifth. But you own the content of what we do, what we say, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. You own that. And that builds the partnership at that level of the project so that the people that are working with me aren't just subject matter expert that waltzes in and waltzes out and they're there for a short time. I got people who get engaged on this. Um, so I think that building a collaborative process where the voices of the master performers get to be heard, get to be captured, get to have influence in the downstream steps. That's really critical building um, um, those partnerships. And so this segues right into the next question. How do you get information you need from a subject matter expert? Well, I'm here to tell you that the research shows that experts can miss up to 70% of what a novice needs. So if you asked an expert in an interview to tell you all, all the steps to do something, they're gonna miss up to 70%. Now maybe they'll only miss 50%. But it's because they are operating uh, with non-conscious knowledge. They've automated their memory. They don't think about it. It's like you driving home and you get home and you pull into your parking spot and you go, 
wow, how did I get here already? Did I stop at that stoplight? I, I don't remember it. Well, you were operating on automatic pilot, so to speak. And experts do that, too. They automate much of their knowledge. It's not something that they can easily recall. It's hard to elicit it and tease it out of them. And so when I'm dealing with subject matter experts, I like to have a room full of them and not one-on-one -on -one interviews. Now, I've had to do one-on-one -on -one interviews, and that means I need to do a whole lot of interviews. It's going to take me a lot longer cycle time, more weeks. You know, If I can run a three-day meeting with an analysis group team, versus three weeks of interviews, the client usually likes the idea of three days instead of three weeks, even though they have to fly everybody in, talk, you know, get in the room and do that kind of thing. But because subject matter experts cannot tell you, if you held Bob Maker's gun to their head, they couldn't tell you everything because it's back in their long-term memory and it's not easily recalled. So. You have to be worried when you're dealing with subject matter experts and how you elicit that. Now, I use my facilitated group process. I've got articles and books, books that are free that you can read if you're really interested. But there's another methodology called cognitive task analysis that one could use to, to elicit this subject matter expert. It's tricky. And so the warning is you can't trust what they tell you initially. And it's not that they're trying to do you harm. It's just that they can't. They can't be forced to read all everything. So it's more of an arduous process to elicit all of it from them. And to, you know, you go back to the same person over and over again and get them to flesh it out, is the phrase. Um, so I, I stumbled upon this, uh, let's get a bunch of people in the room and facilitate them and put it all on flip chart paper and paper the walls and then continuously refer to it, amend what's on the flip chart on the wall as we go through the process and capture everything that way. It's much quicker. It's not perfect, but there is not a perfect approach to this. And so what I tell my clients is that, well, you know, we'll do the analysis that way. I'll work with the same people to do the design. Those people will volunteer to do work with you in development. And the client always goes, oh, no, they won't. They'll be sick of you by then. Oh, no, this is about their job. This is their world. They love this. And they will be there to help you develop content. Now, because they're really mass performers and subject matter experts and their, their, their knowledge is non-conscious, we will have to pilot test the, the training course and pull it, put it through what Guy calls a full destructive test. We're going to try to break this training course because we pretty much believe that there's something wrong with it. We just don't know what it is. If we knew, we'd fix it for the pilot session, but we don't know, so we're going to break it. And I always ask uh, for two groups in the pilot test, typical learners so we can measure learning, and master performers who can tell us whether what was learned was accurate, complete, New people, they don't know what's accurate, complete, and appropriate. Only the master performers can. But you can't measure learning when you put a bunch of master performers in a training class because they theoretically already know it all. They don't, and they'll tell you that, but go, boy, I learned a lot doing this thing. I'm glad I came. But but so you so you have to approach that with subject matter experts and working with subject matter experts. There's a lot written on working with subject matter experts, and most of it I don't like because it's people are they either are aware that, that there's this non-conscious thing going on. And so you can't, tr so I've written a blog post, uh, love your SME, but don't trust them. <laughs> Mr. Wallace. Yes. Um, I have to say the idea of uh, the facilitated group the process. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, wow. I'm sorry, say, say that you wanted to know something about the facilitated yeah. group process. And it was just a comment. The idea of the facilitated group uh, process is really a clever one. Um, I have uh, uh, some friends that work in a pharmaceutical company, a pharmaceutical company, and I had brought in uh, some consultant uh, to improve their performance. And uh, I guess this approach had not been uh, applied, had not been used. And so what happened is that uh, the upper executives wanted to improve the performance of the company, but uh, the other uh, employees uh, who were overworked, uh, they were dealing with very difficult technical problems. Uh, they had to undergo interviews with the uh, performer consultant. And they all thought, 
because they were my friends, they told me they thought that this was a waste of time. They actually were there was no lack of trust. There was no trust at all between the between the, the, the person who had been interviewed and the consultant. So they thought that it was just that we were just wasting their time. And the, the, the actual uh, process was a failure at the end. So the idea of having the idea coming from within the company through the uh, the best performers is really, really a good one because the employees will trust the best performers because they look up uh, at them. Yes. That's very true, and so the and the master performers always, always, always know why the other people aren't master performers. Yeah. <laughs> now I had a I had a, a a group meeting where somebody said, you know, what I do when that happens to me, the other people they would just take no for an answer. I stood on that guy's desk <laughs> and yelled and screamed, and he attended to my needs. So master performers know how to work the system. By definition, they're master performers. They got something going right. And so they can tell you what their strategies and tactics are to avoid problems and what to do if the problems were unavoidable. And average performers and other people that are not, that are climbing the learning curve and down at the bottom, they don't know these things. And so yeah, bringing a group of people together and now the quality movement does this, the quality circles of Japan from the 1950s and 60s and 70s. This is all about bringing the right people together. And you could bring everybody in and, and pretend that everybody's voice is equal and that everybody is as smart as the next person, but that ain't true. And so that's why I ask for the best of the best and if it doesn't hurt you to give them up and put them in this three-day meeting, then we've got the wrong person. You've got a guy Wallace in my not. And by the way, when you use humor and pick on it, you always use your own name. <laughs> who could complain if you called yourself a bozo? You know? um, so dealing with, so this question number nine, what are the recommendations for dealing with clients that only want to uh, see it their way and do that? So... On one hand, he who pays the fiddler calls the tune, and they're the ones paying for this. So at some point, you just might have to salute and do what they tell you to do. Life is like that in the consulting world. Now, I always look for opportunities, a forum, for me to voice my opinions. But in, because I'm just an external consultant, I don't know the nuances of everything that goes on. I could have done observations and interviews and read a bunch of documents and, you know, but I can't pretend that I know all what's really going on. So that's why I try to get the project steering team so I don't have a client making decisions that are silly or stupid. I want a steering team of they and their peers to come to a consensus on what to be done because if my client doesn't really want, doesn't see it correctly and already has something in mind of what they want to do, then that can be the kiss of death. Um, so, so I think that so that's how I do it. I try to balance and get enough people involved and make sure that they are credible, not the friends of training, not Guy Wallace who shows up every time we start a training project. He's there to help out. You know, I guess his department doesn't miss him and would rather see him gone away. And I've actually written about this in my book, Lean ISD, about the friends of training and how they're the kiss of death. And I even tell my project steering teams, I do not want the friends of training, the people that are always there to help. And you know what? They nod their heads because they know who I'm talking about. They know who it is in their company who's always ready to help out the training organization. Now, that doesn't mean that they're automatically not credible, but my experience tells me that I should be very wary of them. And if I have to have a friend of training, I want a bunch of master performers just so that I can, you know, the consensus will go. And a consensus doesn't mean everybody perfectly agrees with something. If nine out of ten people agree to turn left and one person says go right, you know, turn and left. Now, if the client wanted to turn right and uh, other steering team members say, no, we're going to go left. Then we go left. And so I try to manipulate the situation. And I actually tell clients, I'm manipulating you 
but you get the final decision. I'm just and if you so that everybody gets a chance to say what they want to say, and then you guys can decide. And we won't have a perfect consensus all the time. Life's like that. And if nine out of ten of you say go left, and one person says go right, you know we're going to go left. Now the person that said right would be the person who's right, and the rest of us are all wrong. But you know, otherwise you get stymied. You can't make a decision, and you can't move forward. So you've got to move forward with the confidence for the group that you're working. But nothing's perfect in this world. And project steering teams and master performers—they're not perfect either. We're all doing just the best they can. So this, so work, so work with um, with somebody who thinks they know it all. When I facilitate a group of master performers, occasionally is actually not that rare. There'll be one master performer who wants to dominate the conversation. They want to answer every question that I have. And I have to tell them, guy, if you'll hold on for a second here, I'd like to hear from Bill and Sally. And I have to shut them down. That's my job as the facilitator to shut them down so that other people can have voice. And if guy interrupts, I've got to stop guy from interrupting because he's like that. He'll just interrupt and keep on talking and got to dominate everything. It's got to be his way or, you know, he's unhappy. And I, I actually ask project theory teams if I have permission from them to throw somebody out of my meeting and send them back home. Because I, and they'll go, yeah, probably have a problem with that guy Wallace. Yep, yep. He's a master firm, but you know, he, yeah, you could, he'll be the first one to go if we can side bets. Because people that are in business know this kind of stuff happens and that there are people who dominate that they won't shut up. And so I've had to tell people in my meetings, this has happened to me, you know, I've run 250 to 300 of these kinds of meetings over my career. And, you know, there's probably been five times when I've actually had to have people leave or I threaten them to leave, and they've decided that they were going to be good boys or girls, and then they would shut up and be meek and listen to everybody else. But I had to threaten them, and I, they said, "You can't, you can't throw me out of this meeting." I go, "I already have the permission of the of the steering team. You want me to call your boss right now? He can tell you, or she." And so you, you know, when you're facilitating a group of people. You're responsible for what happens. If you own the process and they own the content, then you've got to control the process to make sure all the voices are heard. So you may have to say, Henry, you know, you haven't said anything in a while. Would you please tell us what you're thinking? And everybody else, would you please shut up? People are people understand shut up. And they know why I'm saying it, because some people are all, and sometimes I'm saying that to Henry, and it's really not Henry that I'm talking to. There's three other people that are very quiet, and I've got to give them permission to speak up. And I've got to do that by telling everybody else to shut up. And I'll pick on Henry because maybe he and I have been joking around, and he's gonna he'll be okay with it. He knows I'm just fooling. He's not going to take it personally. But if I ask one of the other people, they might be mortified that I called on them. You know, and I so I I go to Henry, and I go, okay, you haven't said anything. What do you think? You haven't said anything. You haven't said. You got to do that sometimes, Mr. Wallace. Um, Mr. Wallace, is there, is there any questions on any of that, or shall I go to question number eleven? Oh, you're back for more. The room is much better lit this time. Ah. Um, Mr. Wallace, yes. before we go on, uh, uh, there are some questions uh, that are coming from the floor. So, would you mind to answer those before we go back to the document? No, that's fine. Perfect. Okay, sure. So, um, I noticed on your website you talk about the performance gap analysis. And when you do, you mention, it seems that you really emphasize that you're able to do it quickly. And because you had mentioned it so many times, I kind of wondered, how are you able to do it quickly while also being really thorough? Um, good question. It's, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned that a lot because I think that's a major selling point for my clients is that they want things done quickly. And in the... 
uh, I want to say the old days, but it still goes on today, the analysis efforts always take a lot longer than clients will tolerate. In fact, I make comments on social media that I don't see analysis in conference programs anymore because analysis has become a bad phrase or a bad term. Analysis paralysis. And I remember uh, I had a client at Motorola back in 1981 who said, in front of a group of 30 people, my clients, the manufacturing managers of Motorola, he said, I, we hate it when you come back 90 days later, tell us what we told you on day one. And that was so true and is still today so true that people want to do analysis. They want to go do a bunch of interviews. They want to read documents. They want to watch and observe everybody. Again, as if they will understand that performance at a nuanced level. And they can't. It's just not possible unless they came from that world. So I do the performance analysis, which includes a gap analysis, typically in a three-day meeting with my group of master performers and other subject matter experts. And I can get done in three days, what some will take three weeks or three months to get done. And I've got the buy-in of my group of eight to 12 master performers who all agree with what we produced. And therefore I don't have to go through review and update and review again and update again and review a third time and update it again and review and and so that's what happens when, when you do this traditional approach. Um, so I've always known that my clients were in a hurry. And one other thing that I think traps people, they think they have to do a perfect analysis. When I know I just have to do enough analysis to get into a design and while we're doing design, you know what we're also going to be doing while we're doing design? We're going to be doing analysis. <laughs> we defer till we need to do more analysis. But if I'm doing the design and say, okay, we're going to have an exercise here and people are going to do this stuff here. Let's articulate the, the hands-on exercise. That's a form of doing analysis to find out what are all the little micro steps that people have to do. What do you produce? Do you have to fill out a form and do you know, whatever it is. Um, and then whatever analysis data we don't capture in the analysis phase or the design phase, when we get to the development phase, you know what we're going to be doing while we're doing development? Analysis. <laughs> That's right. And you're gonna, so there are people, so when I worked at Motorola, the, the big boss said that he wanted us to produce design documents that we could hand over to somebody brand new and they could create the training. Everything was in that design document, everything. And I argued with him, he was three levels up for me. This is how I, so I argued with him and said, well, you know, if I'm going to write a design document to that level of detail, I might as well just develop the thing myself. And so I've never bought into that. You have to do all the analysis. You got to overturn every single rock. You've got to look here. You got to look there. It'll just take forever. And your client is, wants to get Bob Baker's gun out and shoot you. Um, that's a joke. Poor joke. But anyway, so I facilitate the group process to make things go quick. I have designed my methodology to, to be robust to that, that when we get into design, we're doing design and doing a little analysis. And when we get into develop, we're actually developing and doing micro analysis because we have to write down every single step and then you can enter. But I didn't need to know that those, those micro steps can enter when I was doing the design. And I didn't need to capture that when I was doing the analysis. But too many people think that they've got one shot to do analysis, they'll never be able to do any more, and so they take forever a day. And so I, so I think one of my selling points for my methodology is that I can create a training and development path, a learning path, a job, and from start to finish be done in 30 days. And clients are going, 
No, you can't. And I go, well, I can and I will if you hire me to do it. And I'll write you a project plan and tell you exactly what we're going to do. We're going to have a, this meeting with the steering team. We're going to have an analysis team meeting. We're going to meet with the steering team to review the analysis data. We're going to do the design team meeting. Then we're going to review the design with the steering team. Then we're going to do the development and create this stuff. And all the people, master performer, and other subject matter experts that were involved will want to participate in the development. And they all go, that's a lie. That will never happen. They hate us. I go, well, they'll love this project because it's their voices that we're capturing and they're going to want to make sure that we don't screw it up in development, all their hard-earned efforts, because Guy would tease them and say, gee, I hope we don't screw it up from here. Uh, you know, maybe you should help us with the development. They go, well, yeah, sign me up. I'll be there. Um, and they'll want to be in the pilot test. And I said, I can't have all of you in the pilot test because i got to have actual learners who I can measure learning from. I can't measure learning with you, so you can't hog up the seats. And sometimes it's okay, but other times it's not okay to have, you know, 20 observers on the side of the room listening in on everything because they can't help but say, you know, raise their hand and want to contribute and participate in the class because that's just how they are. They get so engaged with it. But anyway, so doing this gap analysis quickly, doing the design quickly, doing the development quickly, uh, is function of a team approach, a team of the right people, and having a solid, proven process. You can form a team and then waste everybody's time and not get very far, so you've got to really know what you're doing. So a good process, populate the right people doing the right thing at the right time, voila, it works wonders. Um, and most corporations are not used to working that way, it depends on their client, though. So training organizations don't work that way. But if I tell the engineering manager, my client's client, this is how I do this, he goes, that's an engineering approach. Yes. And I go to the quality department, they go, that's how we do quality teams. Yes. It's the same thing. I've stolen those ideas from elsewhere. I didn't make this up out of you know, from whole cloth. So so I think that that's, that's the secret to it at all. And I can't emphasize... You know, working with teams, being, you know, all of you will, regardless of where you go in your careers, are going to have to learn how to work in teams. You can't work in teams. you got to go find a Lone Ranger job someplace where you can be in the fire uh, wash out on some tower by yourself for six months. Because if the rest of the world is working in teams, where you bring a collection of people who know various things together and the whole is greater than some so they, you bring all the right people together, they feed off of each other, they make things go much quicker rather than, you know, the slower traditional approaches that businesses used to do. Not all businesses do it the newfangled way, but many do. And, and if they have, if you know how to plan a meeting and run a meeting, because I've been in a lot of meetings where the people who are running it, obviously, this was their first time, even though they were in the last 12 meetings. But every one of their meetings, it's like they never learned a thing about how to plan a meeting and conduct a meeting and to make it go quickly and get things done. You know, so those are other skills. Did that answer more than answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any other questions before I go back to my pages? Go ahead. Guy, can you talk about where evaluation fits into the PACT process? Yes. Well, so there's formative and summative evaluation. So the analysis efforts and the design and all that, you're, 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 you're conducting the formative evaluation. When you do the summative, it's in the pilot test. So when you do a pilot test, you're gonna take a training course or a job aid, now it's called performance support, or you're building a new computer software program to help facilitate the work and you're training people on how to use that. When you go pilot test that, you pilot test it just as you would deliver it in regular, normal deliveries. But you have to evaluate the heck out of everything. So you have to evaluate lesson one and lesson two and lesson three and lesson four. You have to evaluate the whole thing. So when you're, so my ad model doesn't have a box called evaluation because normally that means after you release the court for general use and people participate in it. But a major uh, one person would have taught us that you better pilot test things before you release them to debug it before you foist your crappy course on the world. 
and then they tell you about it later. You might as well catch that early. So the very first delivery I tell clients is a little special, but it's a delivery. We're actually going to train people, but we're going to have the room for master performers. They can tell us that we train them garbage stuff on things that aren't real, aren't feasible in the real world with gravity. You know, so, so the first delivery, you have to spend time doing um, the, your evaluation where you're making sure that learning is occurring and that, and if you are approaching this for performance-based training that people, you're trying to predict whether people can go back to the job and perform. And so you're trying to, perform, you know, your training should be authentic, the content should be authentic, the exercises should be exactly what they're going to do back on the job. Because that's what you're trying to do is prove to them and build, help build the individual's confidence so they can do it because they did it in training. So if I'm taking customer complaints in your training course and it's all easy and the other person always goes, oh, well, thank you very much. That doesn't happen in the real world. That other person that you're taking the complaint from needs to scream and yell at you um, using bad language and everything. Because if that's real, that's what you need the training to do. So you, when you're evaluating it, you're trying to predict. So you have to understand the terminal performance out there in the real world, in the job. And that's what you're trying to replicate in your practice exercises is the real world. Now, it may not be totally authentic with all sorts of extra lights buzzing around you and the cognitive overload and you can't learn a thing because there's too much going on. So you have to approach those kinds of things, but that's where evaluation happens. Then, so the Andy model, uh, what I don't like about it, my model is a new product development model. I build it, I pilot test it, make sure it's okay. We update it, we ship it, put it on the LMS, the learning management system, we put it in the file cabinets, or we send it out to all the instructors, whatever, however it's going to be deployed. And then we collect valuation data off of it as being used in the real world, delivery after delivery after delivery. Now, if you're uh, paying attention to what's going on in social media, there's the four levels of evaluation. Some people have the five levels of evaluation. And, you know, there's reaction. Do people like it? There's mastery. Do they master the objectives? Hopefully the objectives are authentic and not phone only stuff. Third, did it actually transfer to the job? Are people actually using what you train them to do out on the job? And level four, was there uh, a result? I always learned that that result was ROI, but there's a five level model that says ROI is the fifth level after results. So, you know, whatever. But one of the things that, that's faulty in our business is that we use these, it's called smile sheets for the level one evaluations. Oh, I liked it. The room was comfy. I love that instructor. Oh, they were wonderful. Well, research has shown that this is, that's the data you get from level one evaluations has nothing to do with the results out for so, I have a friend, Will Tallheimer, you should have him come and speak to your class here. I'm sure he'd be willing to do that. But he's written a book about um, improving smiles tests so that they give you more valuable data. Um, one of my colleagues at ISPI just passed away last week, a guy named Roger Chevalier, worked for Century 21 Real Estate. And he came in and took over the training organization and he had 100 instructors. And he took a look at the bottom 10 instructors as rated by the trainees. And he did some research. He looked at those instructors and what the people were saying about them. Then he looked at those 10 bottom instructors and their students and how well they were performing out in the real world. And the bottom 10 instructors had the best performers in the entire system. Now, everybody hated those damn instructors because they made them do extra work and they had to do this, and they had to do that, and all the other instructors were giving them cookies. And so the level one evaluations told you the opposite of what is going on in the real world. So level one evaluations, smile sheets, I don't like them, but I use them. And But I'm really trying to help me understanding what is fixed courts. And if the room temperature is a problem, yeah, that's good to know. Whether they like the instructor, I really don't care. Because I either I know the instructor is delivering a valid set of training content. If people don't like it, I was in 
camp at the Navy, I didn't like one day of the 16 weeks. So my instructors would have gotten failed grades from me. But did they prepare me to go into the Navy and my job? Yeah, they did. I just didn't want to be there in the first place. Um, but anyway, so you can't trust the evaluation systems. And in fact, if you're going to do evaluation, my recommendation always is start with results. Are you getting the business results? Did sales go up? Did costs go down? Did the cycle time get reduced? Did the customer complaints go down? Whatever the real world business metrics are, start there. And if you're not getting that, then go and look and see, did it even transfer? Did what we taught them, did they, did they, did they, are they even trying to do that out there in the real world? And if they're not, then you can go back and look, well, did they not master the objectives? So you work it backwards, go four to three to two. And then you might, if they didn't learn the objectives, you could find out maybe they didn't master the objectives because they hated the instructor. And maybe that's the real reason. But you don't start with one. It's the, and, and, and the person who is renowned for creating that, that model one through four, Patrick, um, even though he didn't really create it, but, but he's known as the creator of it. Um, he never suggested that it be done in a hierarchy as levels. He just said it's four different types of evaluation. What he should have told everybody back in the 1950s when this all came out was that start with number four or reverse the, the, the number on each one of the boxes, but start with results because that's what's important. Regardless of whatever career you go into, whether it's got anything to do with training or not, that's what you should be looking at. You shouldn't be looking at beha people's behaviors. That's secondary. You look at results. You may not like the way they look. You may not like the way they sound. You may not like anything, but if they're producing results, you should not care. Yeah, so I guess this is, I think, I know now your opinion about course evaluations. <laughs> when we about, see about what? Course evaluations. That you have? Yeah. Yeah, so it's the same idea, right? Like liking the instructor or whatever. And then right. our students go and succeed in their internships and everything. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <that. laughs> so, so, focus on the results. Yeah, focus on the results. That's really what it's all about. Regardless of whether you go into a marketing job, uh, it's really all about the, the outputs and whether they meet the stakeholders' requirements. There's customers, but there's regulators, there's other, you know, and every one of your stakeholders has a group of stakeholders. So the regulators have stakeholders, the customers have stakeholders, the customer has a customer who has a customer who has a customer who has a customer. You need to understand how your thing, your product or service impacts way downstream from where you are producing this stuff. It has an impact, which has an impact, which has an impact. And it may not, and if something goes wrong 27 steps downstream, it might be your thing that's the cause of it, but it doesn't even show up until step 14, and then you get a clue, and then 27, everything blows up. So so under, being able to look, uh, taking a systems view of processes and outputs and understanding what the key measures are for both of those and understanding that downstream, you have to be cognizant of that as well. It's not just about you and your little world of your process and your outputs. It's a big, long value chain that we're a part of. And you need to understand that as best you can out as far as you can. And you need to understand when you have problems, it could be because you have incoming garbage, garbage in, garbage out, good stuff in, good stuff out. But if the stuff coming in is variable, and most of the time it's really good and great and perfect and all that stuff, but every once in a while on Wednesdays, you know, it's garbage. You know, so sometimes you have to work. That's what a performance consultant does. They determine in this box, we don't have a problem. It's upstream from us. We're getting bad inputs. And it doesn't happen often enough that we catch them all. It doesn't show up until two steps down from us. That's where it shows up. Um, anyway, so let me go on to this next, I'm on number 11 here, I got to get to 17, yes. <laughs> Just a quick follow-up with the Starbucks example. Um, yes. If you were to go in, who would you have as your uh, master performers? Who would you select, and since a multinational company, how would you decide? On well, 
that's what I get the steering team to do. I get the steering team to pick the master performers. Now, those are those are usually political decisions, but we live in a world of politics. So in the Starbucks thing, I would say, who are the managers that don't tolerate any of that crap? Who are the managers have fired people for cause? And the cause is, you know, they're exhibiting racist behaviors or whatever the issues are. I want those managers here. And then they can tell, talk to us about the real world and how they deal with the real world because there are people who are racist out there. And, oh, they, you know, so you can't help but hire them because they don't wear a badge. They come in and you find out after their, you know, 90 day period, or whatever, and all of a sudden you've got to deal with it. Well, what does a manager do? Well, they try to find those things as soon as possible and take care of it as quickly as possible. And so, what are their strategies and tactics to? avoided the problem in the first place, and if it's unavoidable, what the heck do you do now? Master performers do that for a living. They do that day in, day out. They got a million war stories to tell you about these things, how they happen. Um, and that's their value. They are credible. They know more about that performance than you as a performance consultant or instructional consultant will ever, ever know. So I... I pretending that I would know that stuff. So I just leverage them now, picking them. So when I'm working with a project steering team and I ask them to give me the best and I describe who I'm looking for and people who are willing to voice what they think, but willing to listen to other people too, because I don't need other you know, people that will just, you know, let anybody else talk. Um, so I, it's a pressure. So the, on the project steering team, I've had project steering team members say, Hey, you just sent Guy Wallace into this thing here. I'm sending Bill, my best person here. If you, I'm not sending Bill if you're sending in Guy. And so I'll tell the steering team, don't do that to me. Don't play games. You know, give me your best people. If it really hurts for you, give it to us for three days. Then I think we have the right person. And I need all you other steering team members. You know who the master performers are working in these other people's regions or divisions or stores or whatever the deal is. And you know who their best people are. Make sure that that's who they're volunteering into this thing here. You know, garbage in, garbage out, good stuff in, good stuff out. You give us the best people, we'll get the best product. You give me the bottom of the barrel and I'll produce a piece of crap for you and we'll find out in the pilot session after you spend a whole bunch of time and money. So what do you want to do? So, I mean, because I know as an external consultant, I know who the right people are. They've got to decide that this is worth it. And again, if the project isn't worth in giving your best people, I, I give you four options at the beginning of each meeting. At the end of the meeting, you're either going to shut this down because it doesn't make any business sense, or there's not enough return for the investment or whatever, or you just don't like me. Shut it down. So if you're not going to give your best people to this thing, I'll, just, I'll go back to my home and start my next project with my next client. You know, it's a business decision. Take it. So I've got to put peer pressure on them to choose the right people. And if I give them the ability to nominate some management spy, of course, not everybody on the team can be a management spy. I need to have real live master performers. So you decide you're going to send here who tell you the God's honest truth of whether the analysis team produced a bunch of crap and it's all stupid and, uh, you know, we should fire a guy. And, uh, you know, so I talk with my steering teams like that. I tell them, you, you know, Let's not play games here. Let's be adults. You send in your management spy. If they tell you this is we're doing stupid stuff, then you should end the project when we next meet. So long, long-winded. That's all I got is long-winded answers. I'm sorry. All right, moving on to question eleven. What advice? Uh, what is some advice that you wish you received when you first started off in the training and development industry? I got it. It was focus on performance and the outputs. I was lucky. I fully appreciate those people are not so lucky. They um, work on content. They get a project and they start gathering content and they start working the content and they do not know what the hell somebody's going to do with that content, but they're getting that content. So, so the advice I would give to you is that if, if you have a client that comes to you and they want you to develop some training content on a topic, you need to convert that topic into tasks. 
You know, if they said we need customer satisfaction, I know well, what's the tap? If people had this customer satisfaction thing, what the heck would they do with it? What are their tasks? What are their outputs? And of course, this is difficult. A lot of our clients pick topics they have training developed on. And if you're going to do something like have a customer service attitude, oh, everybody in the whole company should have that customer service attitude. Well, then that's a lot of different task sets and outputs. Because every department would have you exhibit their customer satisfaction attitude different. So that becomes a dilemma when we're going after mass audiences with a topic that has face validity, but it doesn't have any more validity beyond face validity. Oh, yeah, everybody needs to have that customer service, but you can't train everybody. You can't teach them what customer service and then have them not practice it and then go back and do it. So it won't have the impact, won't transfer. They'll master all the objectives and they'll smile like, Big smiles on level one evaluation. Um, it's so no matter what, again, no matter what career you take in your lives, if you learn to have a performance focus, if you become an individual contributor or a manager, you will be looking at your own and others' outputs and the process or tasks that they employ to produce those outputs and where they get their inputs from. And you'll need these same skills regardless of where you go in business. Every supervisor, every manager ought to know how to do this. They all always up. Um, and so I think that I was lucky that I got this performance orientation. We looked at outputs or what Tom Gilbert called work performance. And um, he wrote a book about on human confidence that came out, I guess, 40 years ago this year. And, uh, it's kind of a classic. And he's a behaviorist who studied with Skinner, but um, there's a lot of, so this, it's a book that's hard to read. It took me three times to get through the darn thing. I was given it as like the second book to ever read in, in my profession. And it took me three times to get through it because it was hard to read. Better book is Bob Baker's Analyzing Performance Problems. That'll give you a performance orientation. He's a training guy, but he looked at, well, what are the other variables and factors? And it's a very easy book to read, a great writer. So that's what I wish for everybody else. When I hired new staff people in my consulting firm, the first book that I gave was up with Mager and Pike about analyzing performance problems. The subtitle was, but they really ought to wanna, which is a joke. They really ought to want to perform, but there's things in their way, or they don't know what they're doing, or they've been demotivated, or there's 1,300 other bigger priorities, and that's why they're not doing it. It's not that they don't know how, if they would if they could, but there's other factors in the environment. That's what a consultant has to tease out. Number 12. <laughs> Do I use to stay updated and engaged in the industry? Um, I've been writing like forever. I first published a fact in the uh, early 80s. And uh, so I do a lot of my own writing, which means I have to do a lot of reading so that I can think intelligently about things and uh, leverage off of other things that I've learned from reading other people's things. So back in the day, you know, this is back in 1979 and 80, you know, we used to go to conferences and that was the only time we got a chance to see people in the industry. And we'd have big, you know, parties and drinking parties after the conference and during the day even sometimes. And, uh, but that was it. But now you guys have got all this social media and YouTube and everything else. And so you can, you don't have to go to the annual conferences and big companies send people to big conferences anymore like they used to. They used to do it all the time. Those days are gone. So I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. I've got, you know, 3,000 some people that I'm connected with on that. Uh, you know, most of them are lurking or in the shadows or, you know, don't ever get on it, but so you have to pick people, um, just like your mother told you, hang out with the good crowd, not the people who got bad and valid garbage and talk about learning style. Don't bring up learning styles to me because I'll off the tape. Um, <laughs> but so you need to find people who are credible and you need to network into that. Um, 
And so I follow people who are in the instructional design business, in the performance business, who specialize in sales and in marketing and in the quality movement and OD, organizational design kinds of things. So that's who I follow because that's these are all the people in all these various functions of modern corporation who are working to improve performance. Um, I'd follow design engineers if I knew of some, but because they're basically designing the processes to make stuff. And I'm all about process, which another word for processes, outputs or tasks. Processes produce outputs, tasks. Process is nothing but a bunch of tasks, tools, and everything else inside the process box to produce these outputs. Um, but I think staying engaged professionally, um, you have to invest some time in it. Uh, the network that you establish may help you find a job. And the time to really work your network is not the day you lost your job. You're like a year or two behind already. You know, you should have been working on this all along. Uh, that's a big mistake people make. You see them, I, I'm, I'm, I'm connected with them. They lost their job. All of a sudden, they're very active in social media and they want to, you know, help, have help from their net. But, you know, they're, they're serious as a professional unless they're getting their insight and growth from other places. So you have to invest some time. Just hang out with the right people who are got valid stuff. There's a lot of garbage out there. There's a lot of foo, what I call it foo foo. Other people call it snake oil. Other people just call it bullshit. There's a lot of it out there in our, in the instructional world. There's just a lot. We are caught up in all these fads, fallacies, and all this stuff, and it's a shame. I was lucky that I got involved with ISPI, SPI back in the day, and they didn't tolerate that. Um, I used to go to conferences, and I, I have a radio TV film degree. I don't know a lot about instruction or performance, you know, so I would go to these conferences and be really just hungry for it all. And nothing pleased me more than in the middle of somebody's take to have a person stand up and yell from the seats up to the podium. They would yell, do you have any data to support that? My favorite part was somebody on the other side of the room would jump up and, and yell, and data is plural. So we didn't want an end of one that you have so one study that proves something and you're making these outrageous claims. So I always felt comfortable in that environment because these other people had their BS detectors on high gain. They were listening for all silly, stupid stuff up at Ballad and they would call the speakers out on it. Now the organization got a bad reputation for being tough on speakers, hard on speakers, and I loved it. Because that's what I need. I need to have they tell me, don't for that garbage. I learned about learning styles being bogus back in the early 80s. I learned in 1979 that the Myers Briggs indicator was baloney, to put it politely. I was scared to hear a lot of things that have been disproven by research, even though there's research out there that proves it, and it's, but you gotta look at who's doing the research and where, where do they make their living? Well, they make their living selling MBT stuff, and that's why they do research proofs. So, but there's a lot of it. That kind of is a segue into what do I think are the most overrated and underrated trends in the industry? Number three, question 15. So what, so, so, so what's underrated is analysis. I brought this up earlier. You don't see it in conference programs anymore. No one's talking about analysis. I put something out about two weeks ago on Twitter and LinkedIn going, does nobody talk about analysis in conferences anymore? I don't see anybody mentioning the word. Is it like got the kiss of death on it or what? And other people were chiming in going, well, we're delivering workshops on analysis and all that. So it's still out there, but it's not like it used to be a big deal because you don't have good analysis data, you're gonna pretty much produce some questionable stuff, otherwise known as garbage. So underrated is doing analysis, and another thing that's underrated is actually doing design. Most people jump in and start with development. And that's, that. and when you get into development, most people don't start with developing the learning objective first, or on the learning objective, then building the test. 
or exercise that will prove that somebody could actually meet that learning objective. And then maybe design a demonstration, a video demonstration of the performance, just like the exercise people are going to be in. And when they're done with the learning objective and then the test, and then the demonstration, then they can choose what information to give. But most people start on the information and generate a whole bunch of information, whether anybody needs it or not, but just in case they need it, we've got it. And then there's usually no time for hands-on exercise where people can actually apply what they're learning. And that's, a, that's an underrated uh, element in our world is that there's not enough practice with feedback. And people need to practice things more than once. You try it once and get some feedback, and they should get that feedback just before they try it again. Because if you give it to them and then they have to wait for eight other people to do it, by the time they can stand up and do it again, they've kind of forgotten the feedback or most, more likely they've dismissed it all. And ah, oh, guy didn't know what he was talking about. I, I I didn't do that poorly. I did really pretty good, I think. And no one actually, I probably sucked. But so that, that's key. A couple other overrated things are micro learning. This is known as chunking content and has been since, you know, I before I got into business in 1979. But chunking content is now called micro learning. And micro learning is okay as a concept, but it's right. So uh, spaced learning or reinforcement learning. So you teach me something in a class, and then as soon as I leave the class, I quit climbing the learning curve and I get on the forgetting curve and the forgetting curve is steeper than the learning curve and you go faster than the forgetting curve. So this micro learning concept, space learning concept, reinforcement learning concept is to keep reminding me what I learned and there's retrieval. So if you make me think about it and answer some little quiz questions two weeks out after class, I'm more likely to remember it two months later. Otherwise, it's just I'm just going to forget it. My brain got overloaded with everything else going on in the world here, and so I'm going to forget some of this stuff. If I don't use it, I lose. It. So in the classroom, the way to combat that, if we actually want this stuff to transfer out to the job site, people need to practice and practice and practice and practice. And perfect practice makes perfect, not just any old practice. So perfect practice is authentic, smells and feels like it will out on the job. And... That's, that's something, micro learning is overhyped as a thing. It's a real thing, it's a good thing, but it's overhyped nowadays. And as, as is storytelling. Everybody, you know, this storytelling on everything, and I've pushed back on the social media and said, I don't want a story for everything you're gonna tell me, teach me. I don't need a story, I'm too impatient for that. And I've been in the business long enough where I remember where we used to have to read the instructors, instructor-led training, to stop telling their damn war stories. Because they could take up all the time in the classroom telling their war stories of what happened to them, how they planned, blah, 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 blah. And no one learns that much. You tell a story as kind of an advanced organizer to prepare the learner to learn the details that you're going to give them. So short stories need to be short and sweet to the point, you know, and set the stage, so to speak. It's like there's this old saw in about presentations. A presentation is three parts. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. And then tell them what you told them. And you're bookending the meat. By telling them what you're going to tell them in an advanced organizer and a story can serve that purpose. Or a story might help the reflection. After you've learned something, you need to reflect on what you've learned and... You know, people telling their own stories about how that would play out and how they would apply with it, you know, kind of telling a truthful story, how they might put a little bit different. That, that could be helpful. But I look, it's way too much about the story you tell. Um, an underrated trend is this notion of performance support, what we call forever job aids. And so people don't have to memorize everything. You can't memorize it. And so it's good to put checklists and other types of guidance. I think it used to be called guidance as well back in the day. And so when you, it, it's instructional, you know, if the job eight says, there's the 12 steps, do them in this order, or you can do step three or in any order you want. We don't care. It doesn't really matter. Just make sure you do three and four before you get to five. 
So since everybody's got a smartphone nowadays, it's easy to deploy job aids. Back in my day, it wasn't easy to do that, but now everybody can get to the website and download the job aid performance support and all those things. So there's there's a big movement to support informal learning and but to me job aids or performance support is really kind of formal. You know, sometimes I can follow a job aid or a performance support and then forget about it. I don't have to learn or memorize anything other than how to find it the next time I need it. Um, but I think that that's an underrated thing. It, uh, there, uh, they go heartless, had a famous quote, inside every fat course is a thin job aid screaming to get out. And so too many fat courses, binders, you know, this thick, um, should have been, you know, one page, two page job aid, and that would have been sufficient. And you sometimes you don't even need instruction. Sometimes you don't need training on how to use the job aid, but other times you do. And practicing the job aid should be authentic. That's the real world work. And so that, that ties into the need for practice for feedback. Um, my least preferred aspects of consulting are submitting a proposal and then waiting a long time to hear whether it's a go or a no-go or nobody returns your calls or emails nowadays. Uh, I did a 20-month project in Toronto that started in uh, 2013. And it took 10 months for us to get, hear about it. And five months after we did the proposal, we met in Toronto in the boardroom with the CEO and all the top leaders. And they were supposed to decide that in that meeting, they were going to have our meeting and then excuse us and wait in the lobby and they'd come out and tell us when we were going to start. Well, they came out and told us, well, we don't know when we're going to start. And so we had to wait another five months before the thing started. It started. And so you just never know. And I've had, I put out plans and proposals and then two years later, somebody calls me up and said, hey, can you still do that thing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't recognize the voice, it's been two years. <laughs> Is that you, Bob? Um, anyway, so that's, that's frustrating. And if you're, if you paying the rent, it's depending on that, that's a tough place to be. That's another reason why you shouldn't start off being a consultant. You should go get a, a job with somebody that does this kind of stuff. Learn from them until you built a network of resources that can help you on projects. Because you don't need to be all things to all people. You maybe need to find yourself a graphic artist to do that kind of stuff for you. Um, but more importantly, you need to have a network of how you're going to find clients and how you're going to find a sustained series of projects, engagements that will pay you. And that's the toughest thing, I think, for people going into the business. They think that's going to be easy, and that is damn difficult. And that's the real. And so so a lot of people work one company, one client, and do all their work with one client. And that's dangerous as well because if that client has to shut you off, turn you, you know, stop doing work with you, you don't have anybody else. So my whole philosophy was um, you work with many clients. Oftentimes I'd have seven projects going on simultaneously. I spent most of my professional career in working out of Chicago and my preference was to work in Dallas. I didn't want to work in Chicago. I didn't want to have Chicago clients because you always have more credibility when they brought you in from out of town. <laughs> oh, you're from Chicago, huh? <laughs> the guy from in Dallas would say, yep, they flew me in. So how, how long is this project going to take? Well, I'll be here for the next five weeks. Oh, you're going to stay here over the weekend? No, I'm fine home. Oh, so... <laughs> You know, so I use that to kind of say, you know, okay, I'm a big deal, you know. So you, you know, <laughs> they all here, you know, because your bosses are going to take this seriously because they, you know, they hired somebody from out of town and they flew them in here to work with you. So you better not blow off our meetings because you found something else to do. Because I will tell on you, I'll tell your boss, and I'll tell your boss's boss. As I, you know, what else am I going to do? You didn't come to our meeting. I got nothing else to do. I might as well go, you know, spread the word here. You're not playing ball because I need to get you on the field 
because this is an abort project. So, th so that's also tough here. So you can't be a profit in your own land. You can't be a profit in your own company. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll listen to experts from outside, but people think, listen to you if you're in the company and they won't listen to you with as much credibility or seriousness if you're from that same town. So it's, it's best to travel. And so my rule always was book me a hotel five minutes away from their door. Cause if I have to travel from where I live in Chicago to another client, I might spend three hours in the car in the morning trying to get there. And I hate that. It's another reason. And they won't get you a hotel room because you're in Chicago. <laughs> the, uh, the, my favorite aspects of being a consultant and doing this kind of work was uh, working with smart people, master performers and other subject matter experts and my clients and the project steering team people and all working together for maybe it's not clear exactly what you need to do at the start of the project, but it becomes clearer as you get closer to it and seeing the success, having success. So the focus on performance is the key to that success. Getting the right people involved at the right time is another key to the success. But that's very rewarding. Um, I've spent jobs, uh, product manager jobs at AT&T back in the mid 80s, where I interviewed a whole bunch of people because they couldn't do the group meeting. I interviewed a whole bunch of people and I interviewed people who'd been in the job for three years and they confided to me that they weren't sure that they knew what the job really was and whether they were doing it well enough or not. And they were very fearful. Um, and so when I went to design their curriculum path, the learning path, and created the modular content, I had to make sure that I could help those people see what their job was. And the job of product manager involved eight different seg segments of the job. Um, and sometimes people would be assigned two of those segments and that would be their job. So the person in the queue next to them, same job title working in the same business unit, they were doing something different. And that caused anxiety in people. They were fearful. <coughs> um, and so one of the things that we can do when we focus on performance and train people to perform their jobs we give them confidence. We really, besides impacting the business for good, we're impacting people's lives and helping them. And sometimes people have to make that decision that they are the round peg in a square hole and they're in the wrong job. And sometimes that happens because our recruiting and selection processes aren't always adequate to the need. And sometimes the clear training can help people decide this is really for them. If you were a person that couldn't take rejection, you don't want to be in a sales environment where you have to make 27 sales calls to get one sale. That's a lot of rejection in between every sale and they don't come every 27. Sometimes you get three in a row and now you've got three times 27 rejections before you're going to hit the next sale. And that's demoralizing to some other people. They've got the personality. They, yeah, rejection, that just pumps them up even more. So... One of the things that, I, that also comes out of a uh, focus on performance and looking at what are the uh, tasks and, out and the skills required is that you can help affect the selection process for those jobs so that the client, your client can hire in people with the right fit. They may not know what they need to know. But they may have the psychological uh, attributes that they need or the intellectual att attributes. You know, some people are, are born to be strategic planners. Some people are born to be tactical planners. Some people are born to be both. It's like switch hitting in baseball. Not everybody can do it. And sometimes the job requires a switch hitter. And sometimes that's not really clear and people are fumbling and stumbling around in their jobs and they need help. And so sometimes training can help them become more of a, a tactical, concrete planner, but other times not. And I, so that's, I think I find I get a lot of uh, uh, personal uh, satisfaction out of working on those kinds of things. Um, training people are usually humanists. We love to help people. Um, if you don't, if any of you in the room don't like to help people, you know, uh, is it too late to cancel out of the class? That's a joke. All right, question 16, what's the biggest mistake I made as consultant? Uh, you know, I 
I had made a mistake, but it was a mistake. It wasn't really a mistake, and so that was like, I'm just going to throw it. So I hired, uh, tried to figure out how to do the best job of hiring other consultants, people who were okay with traveling and being on the road, maybe three out of four weeks. You know, because when you, your clients are out of town, I had clients all over the country, I had clients in Europe, um, that, that requires traveling. So some people think traveling is exciting. It's not exciting seeing the airport and the dark uh, highway as you drive to the hotel and check in and then drive in the dark to the client side in the morning and then when you leave the building, it's dark again. There's nothing exciting or sexy about that. It's, you know, so business travel is not usually a lot of fun. Now, you can plan to stay an extra day sometimes and have some fun, but, you know, that's, that's uh, uh, rare. But so... Hiring the right people for my, my uh, in-house team, my production staff that I had back in the day, people don't do that anymore, but I had traveling consultants and I had in-house staff doing all the production work and putting the binders together because we used to do binders back in the day. I don't think you do that anymore. But um, so that's <laughs> And you have to be willing to step up to... Um, discovering when people are the wrong fit and addressing it for their own good because nobody is happy in a job if they don't fit well. They just may be fearful. They may have rent to pay and food to buy and kids to clothe and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, then, then it behooves you if you hired them to work with them to help them find some other place to land. You just can't pull the rug off. That's not the humanist thing. Um, the second thing was uh, While well, this was rare, empowering others too soon. I had a young woman come to work for me back in 89, and she came to me after about six months and said she had a former boss that was in a new company that wanted to hire her to do a training project. And I wasn't sure that she really had the skills to do the analysis and design yet. She could develop. If I gave her a design and the analysis data, the design, and, and had her have uh, access to the analyst who had done the design, um, she was fine. But she took on this project, and then her former boss called me up and complained about it and didn't like the work that she had done, all that stuff. And it demoralized her because she had heard about from that her, her client, the former boss. And she, she lost a lot of confidence in doing that. And so... It's bad for me as a business because I had to tell the person, okay, no charge. You know, so I had to eat all the costs that we had been to the whole thing. Um, and, and it was harder for me to work with this young woman because she was really, it really affected her. And um, I had seen that before, but it wasn't one of my own employees that I saw that with. So, um, so empowering people is a good idea if they're ready. Empowering people too soon is like sink or swim. Throw them in the deep end of the pool and see what happens. Um, and that's unfortunate. And that's not uh, fair or right. It's also one of the reasons why, if you've heard of this learning model, the 70-20-10, yeah, when I write about it, I go 10, most 10 before, most 20 before, most 70. Because if you rely on informal learning, 70, that's sink or swim. That's expect people to figure it out on their own. And so I think they need formal training uh, and guidance up front. And then 20 is talking and learning from your peers and your neighbors and other experts. And then 70 is learning by trial and error. And the model, unfortunately, doesn't have good uh, data to back it up. It's kind of a foo-foo model, if you will, but it's very popular. So you'll be hearing about it and dealing with it. But it's a mistake to present the 71st and then the 20 and then the 10. It sends the wrong message to people who don't understand that, and eh, they didn't really mean that. <laughs> it's just, you know, they had to put it in some order, and that's the order they chose. Because we learn most things informally on the job. What good training can do is prepare me to learn informally on the job and help me avoid invalid things. As a training person, I should have learned that learning styles is bogus. And that way, with that, when I'm out there informally learning, and I come across this all this learning style stuff, and a whole bunch of people that love it, 
they've, they've changed it to preference style. Now they have a different preference. It's not learning styles. They have a learn preference for different modes of delivery, which is the same nonsense, but they've just, you know. But so I know to avoid that because I was trained properly. Now I got my training, a lot of my training, because I had smart people that I was working with, way smarter than me, and they were experienced that they exposed me to all this stuff, ISBI. Um, so, so I've been very careful about empowering people and you would need to worry about that too. So how did I come up with my pack processes? I hated the Addy model. I hated the Addy model. It didn't have planning on the front end. Um, when I saw people do analysis, task analysis, I saw lists of tasks as if they were in random order. They could have put them in alphabetical order. They were just task, 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 task. There was no, no logic, no structure to it, and I hated that. And so I created my pack processes to be um, more rigorous, more structured. It's very structured, but it's got some flexibility to it. But it basically uh, makes sure that it can get the job done. And I've uh, almost used all of our time. And I know you guys have other lives to get to after class. So I'll end here and be happy to answer any final questions or stay late if somebody wants to stay late and ask me other questions, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Carrie Wallace. Thank you for your insight, insightful thoughts about the performance consulting and thank you for your time again. <laughs>